Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Madam Speaker, so you and I'm honoured to split my time with the Member for New Westminster Burnaby, which is a beautiful place of Canada, and appreciate the member's work on this file and several others uh, with his long tenure in this House, and I'll be looking forward to his comments after mine. Uh, with regard to the Conservative motion in front of us, I come from Windsor, Ontario, uh, which is the automotive capital of Canada, and also is actually the border crossing of Canada with the maximum volume in trade that takes place. We've grown up with this as part of our just DNA for the area. So for some of this debate here today, I want to tackle a little bit on the auto industry, but also some of the CBSA elements that have been put forward in this bill, because it is actually in some degrees a little emotional for me, because in my community, uh, we have seen the struggle and also the lack of support for the workers, the men and women that are in the front line of protecting our country and are protecting our country from the United States, even though it is Canada's and the United States' longest undefended border in, in the world. At the same time, there's some very bad people that try to cross in with some bad intentions. Some of them are actually some of our own citizens, some are the American citizens, and they have significant consequences, as any border MP would know, uh, from Hamilton to, uh, to uh, uh, Fort Erie, Niagara Falls, and that area, uh, to other parts of Canada, out to the, even the West Coast. And so I want to refer to that a little bit later, but I want to point out one thing we haven't talked a lot about right now, is not letting the auto industry off for their lack of innovation with regards to stopping auto theft. Here. There have been billions of dollars that have gone towards the auto sector for innovations which I have supported, which are very important, but at the same time, without a lack of a Canadian national auto policy, there is little much we can do in sort of a carrot and stick approach to the issue. And what I mean by that, Madam Speaker, you go back historically, and my father was an executive for Chrysler at one point in time uh, for much of his career. As I remember the days, you know, when we heard the debates about a number of different issues that were brought to the auto sector where they refused to actually innovate. One of the most obvious ones that we can see from the history books is seat belts. This is one of the things that they actually resisted for many different years. And you can remember, Madam Speaker, there was also those automakers that didn't want to stop having smoking devices and smoking elements in cars. There was others that actually had innovations in their vehicles that actually turned out to be um, bad for the public. That would be even with headlights that used to be able to pop up and recess at different times. And so there have been a lot of great innovations and good things that have taken place with the auto sector, but the personal vehicle manufacturing industry does bear some responsibility to this. And when there's massive amounts of public support to help transition this industry into a modern, safer place for all of us, then there is an expectation of public policy should be part of it. And auto theft uh, stopping should be part of it. They've moved to automatic start devices as a competitive industry in the practice in itself. And at the same time, it hasn't kept up with the fact that you can actually hack and you can actually get through these systems. And so there's a dual obligation in these matters. And I have worked with the auto industry over the number of different years, and I am sure that if we put a proper pressure on them and responsibility afterwards, if they don't do that, then we can get some achievements that'll help Canadians. And we have to remember, losing a vehicle is not just a financial crime. The vehicles can often be used in theft during that moment for other victims and other types of crimes that take place. So we have focused a lot, and I'm going to transition a little bit to the exportation issue because Canada has become basically a cottage industry for many of the organized crime elements that want to actually steal our vehicles and sell abroad. But the reality is that just auto theft in general has significant consequences, not for its individual crime, but the subsequent crimes that take place once the vehicle is lifted. Now, I mentioned about the history with regards to the men and women that serve on our border, and I want people to picture what it's like to be on a border. Now, I have a busy community where there's thousands of people that cross every single day. It's actually tens of thousands. And if you're in the pills booth, and that's the booth that you get pulled up to, and you're actually a border officer, in the days that I grew up, at many times, there would actually be sometimes a summer student. At some times, there would actually be people that actually had to borrow um, a vest for bulletproof vests because they didn't actually have enough vests at the border for our workers. So I remember those days, but if you go right now to where they're now, they finally they're armed with regards to having some supports there. In the past, they'd have to rely on municipal or provincial or federal police forces when there's problems with Americans and others that are showing up with arms or other types of illegal weaponry or drugs or other things. And what you have to remember is even under the best of circumstances, they could have somebody pulling up who's their friend their neighbor, 
a family member, somebody they know in the community that they're coaching soccer for or for hockey. And so they have a job that's really hard in terms of making sure that they do the proper scrutiny for every single person that crosses in the sense that they're making sure our country is safe. And so that job is very much a strained job in many respects, and I don't think it gets the support and kind of the understanding that it should happen. And I think that's what led to a famous Liberal quote in this House from Derek Lee, which I still have yet to hear the Liberals officially apologize for, when he called our border officers wimps because they walked off the job because armed Americans were coming, they were identified that they had a criminal background, and they had to walk off because there weren't the proper supports even from law enforcement at that time. And that brought a lot to me in the sense of how far away this place is from the job that has to be done on our border to keep ourselves safe. And so what we've seen is successive liberal and conservative governments not even finish out the terms of collective agreements before they have to start bargaining again. And that's one thing. So it's about a cultural thing is what I'm trying to press upon this debate here, is that we can talk about finally restoring some of the cuts that took place under the conservative regime when they got rid of the detector dogs quite significantly, or when they cut back officers to where right now, where the Liberals have agreed, with a poor training program that right now that's left us thousands of workers short. It's two to 3,000 border service workers, uh, officers are short right now. But we also have to change the culture of that actually organization in itself. And that, Mr. S Madam Speaker, is one of the reasons I do think it will be beneficial to have a round table on that, but I'm wondering how much the union is being included in this. I was actually included in a um, I guess a, a town hall type of task force and meeting in Montreal before with Ralph Goodell when he was public safety minister, and that was on gun violence and so forth. And sadly, all those efforts went nowhere because the government never really followed up on it, and the subsequent government didn't either. So when we talk about the specifics of what's taking place in Montreal, there's some very you know, serious issues or specific ones that actually can be resolved. Right now, they have a limited space and a current team consists of eight officers that look at the actual exportation of um, vehicles and the consequences if they're stolen or not. So you will have in there vehicles that are properly being exported, some are not. And at the same time, we have a limited amount of officers. And there is a fixation right now of making sure that the imports are prioritized over the exports. So again, if we are putting the strain on the officers to actually get the vehicles out there for our supply chain management and keeping those things, then we actually then have to reprioritize how we're doing it. And the conservative motion doesn't really give us a whole lot on that, but what we do know in the port of Montreal is they're also short of space. They're short of space in that area, so the vehicles will get stacked up, even the ones that they actually find that are illegal. They then have to call in the, uh, the Montreal police force to actually help get rid of them because they don't have the right equipment. And you hear this, you know, I talked about the bulletproof vests that were having to be borrowed amongst workers in the day. Well, there in that situation, they don't even have a tow truck or the capability to clear out that space. Management has not done anything with regards to increasing the space available for them, so they have, to, they have rented space to look at these exports. And then on top of that, there has been no solution to increase that space, get our own space, all those different things. So we leave people with very practical problems where it puts the amount of training and the actual, not of training, but the actual inspection as a problem. Now, I also want to make sure that it's important, though, with my last couple of minutes, is to talk about the fact that we have a, a management-heavy industry right now with regards to the CBSA culture and the CBSA of hiring. At some places, there's seven managers to six officers where there should be a better ratio of actually having boots on the ground. And this government has focused on the worst of the things that they can do, like Arrive Canada, where we focused on basically an app versus training officers. And that's one of the worst things. If we have, you know, often the cliche of boots on the ground, then we have to stop looking at technology being the only silver bullet to actually deal with the situation. And the problem, Madam Speaker, is that the technology that we do bring in often is broken down. So I know right now there's screening and other types of equipment that's in Montreal that they had to bring from Windsor, Ontario to actually Montreal because they can't fix the equipment in Montreal. So if we're going to have technology, you have to have the proper sustainable environment for it and train the workers. I want to complete with this, Madam Speaker, and it's very important for it, about the training of the officers. Right now, you actually have to go as a recruit and then you don't get paid. We need to start actually hiring, training, and supporting those people and giving better opportunities for that training to place, take place so we actually get the boots on the ground in a reality. Thank you.